In this video, I'm going to show you my top five rookie mistakes to avoid when working with Power BI reports. We're gonna go through them one by one with some examples so I can show you how to avoid these mistakes. All of that and more, so without further ado, let's get started. Hi, my name is Fanan and welcome to the Solutions Abroad YouTube channel where we cover tips, tricks, and best practices when working with Power BI. I upload new videos every week, so make sure you hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to get notified when a new one is out. So these rookie mistakes that I'll be outlining in this video doesn't necessarily mean that your solutions won't work. It just means that by avoiding these mistakes to begin with, you build a good foundation that you can use and especially helpful when you start working with larger data sets. The first mistake to avoid is to import unnecessary data to your reports. So let's jump right into this example here. Here we have a CSV file that I have uh, saved in my desktop and it just has some employee details. It's got a lot of information here and all we've done is we've imported this into our Power BI report. And what we've done is we've imported all of this data into our Power BI report here. So all the rows and all the columns. Now, generally speaking, it's better for you to just bring in the data that you need into your query. So in this case, if we want to just uh, use some columns, but not all the columns will be used. Like for example, uh, we have some random address here. Uh, that we might not need at all, uh, that we know that we won't need. In this case, we remove them. And as we scroll to the right here, you'll see what I've done is we have some duplicate columns that we probably won't even need to use. Um, so in this case, we can just remove them, making this uh, employee's query a lot simpler. So in order to remove those columns that you don't want to import into your data model, all you have to do from here is select all the columns that you want to keep. So let's say up to postcode, excluding the random address. Now right click on any of these columns and hit remove other columns. What it will do is it will just keep all the columns that you've highlighted except those that you haven't. So as I said, this method keeps your data sets small, which helps with performance and also makes it easier for report development later on. If you're pulling data from a query database, like say a SQL database, removing columns reduces the latency between the Power BI and your database, just because you're asking a parts of the data and not all of it. So this process is called query reduction and I've covered it separately in another video. So if you want to know more about that, go check out that video. So what I can do from here is to show you an example of how it would look like. So here we have another query that I've done, which pulls data from my local host SQL database. And it just has a couple of columns here that we uh, have imported. Now we won't, or let's say we have just a couple of columns that we want to use for our reports here. So let's say all we want is the order ID, unit price and quantity. All we have to do is select all of those right click and remove other columns so the same way that we did with employees now because the source of this query is a query language like a sql database it means that um, you're automatically doing query folding which is essentially just asking for the data that you want uh, once from the database and the easiest way to see if query folding is happening is if you right click on any of the steps here you'll see the view native query option available for you. Now this will let you peek at the requests that you are getting or you're requesting from that SQL database. So now you can see in this native query, instead of asking for all the columns available in that table, we're only asking for a subset of it, which significantly makes this query requests a lot smaller. The next mistake that you want to avoid is not minimizing the number of steps you have in Power Query. So let's go back into this queries here on the left hand side and let's look at employees too. So you can see on the right hand side here under applied steps, we've done a couple of transformations into this data. And if we just head back up a couple of steps from the very beginning, you'll see how it changes. So you'll see that um, we started with a couple of columns, four or five columns, and we've done things like you know, creating new columns, so full name, which is combining first name and last name. Uh, we've done some reorderings. We've created you know, separate columns for month, date, and year. 
and then reordering them and then changing their types etc etc and again having your applied steps like this doesn't necessarily mean the solution won't work but what not a lot of people especially the beginners don't know is you can actually reduce the number of steps and get the same results that we have here so I've actually replicated that in this new query that I have here, employees three. And just pay attention to the number of applied steps here now on this current one, and then on this employees three. So as you see, it has the exact same values, exact same columns with the exact same names, except this one has significantly less number of steps. Now let's compare and contrast what happened here. So the first thing that you'll notice is we actually group steps together. So these steps like changing column orders or changing types, instead of doing them one by one as you make columns or do transformations, we just do it at the very end, which reduces the number of steps you know, in this uh, applied steps section. And one other thing that you might have noticed here is I've spent some time to rename these steps because you can actually rename them yourself to change them into something that is more recognizable. So to do that, you go to the step that you want to rename, just right click and hit rename here. Spending a bit of time on these steps early on, I find is very useful when it comes to collaborating with other devs and it makes it easier for them to read your steps. And what's even better is that it also helps you in the future. So at the moment, you can remember how you did it now, but in six months time, when you're asked to support this same report, you'll thank yourself for making it very easy to read. The third mistake to avoid is not having a single calendar table for your time intelligence. So I've talked about it in this channel again and again, and it's a very easy mistake to do just because Power BI defaults you to not use a singular calendar table and focuses on just mobilizing and getting some results out of your Power BI reports. However, as you start working with larger data sets, you'll start to encounter some performance issues that comes with doing it in this method. I've created several videos in the past covering some of the pitfalls when it comes to not using a calendar table and also how to create them. So if you want to know about them in detail, I'll leave a link in the description box below. But in the meantime, using the snippets from those videos, I've created here a central calendar table uh, that we've generated in Power Query that just generates a set of data in a tabular format that you can use in your data set. If you look at the advanced editor here, this is the snippet of the script that I have in one of my videos. So you can just copy and paste this and you can reuse it as you want. The next mistake to avoid is overusing calculated columns and not using enough measures. So let's go back to our demo here. Let's hit close and apply. And let's go back to our view here. Now let's go to our table view here. Let's look at the order details that we've imported. And if you look at this table, and let's say from here, we want to create a new column, or rather we want to get the total sales from these orders. And in order to calculate the total sales, you know that uh, we need to multiply the unit price against the quantity. Now, if you work with Excel, your instinct would be to create a calculated column on each row that will have the total sales value for you. So you will click this button, new column here, you will create total sales and you will say, give me unit price multiplied by quantity. Now, don't get me wrong, this will give you the right results that you want, but what it actually does is it bloats your data set unnecessarily. The problem is that because you've added this new extra column in your data set, it's added a new layer of data into your data set, making it a lot bigger than it should be, even though you're just getting the total sales from these values. So what you can do instead is to create a measure, which does pretty much the same thing, except that it does its calculation in real time, which means that calculations are only done in the reports only when it's needed. So it doesn't add an extra set of data or columns in your table. So to do that, it's pretty simple. You just create a new measure here and let's say total sales tax and we can do a sum x of our order details and we can do net price multiplied by quantity which you won't see here because as we said it doesn't add a new column into your table but if we show it here 
into the report view, you will be able to get that measure. And learning the difference between calculated columns and measures is not a very common sense thing to have. So I've covered this extensively in a separate video to explain to you when and how to use one or the other. So if you want to know, go check out those videos. But roughly speaking, you use measures when you want to do calculations in your expressions and you use calculated columns if you want to use it as a filter context. The last mistake that I see a lot is is not using relationships in Power BI. Typically what I see from other Power BI implementations is that they utilize one huge table which has all the data that they need, including all of the columns, all of the filters in this one table. And at a glance, it seems a lot easier to work with because you just have one single table to think about. However, as you start working with larger and larger data sets, you start hitting some performance issues just because you're duplicating a lot of data necessarily in this one huge table. So instead what you can do is you can have multiple tables segmenting the data between each other and creating relationships between these tables, avoiding the unnecessary duplication of your data and also improving the performance of your reports. So if you're stuck with working with flat data models, which is just one huge table and you want to convert it into a data model, I actually covered how to do it step by step in another video. So check it out if you haven't yet. So here's an example of a data model with multiple tables and relationships. So instead of having one orders table uh, or order details, things like products, employees, or customer details are segmented into different tables. So it's easier to identify where to find the data that you need and at the same time improves your report performance. And that's really it for this video. I hope it helped you get a grasp of some of the common mistakes that you should avoid when it comes to working with Power BI reports. Thanks for watching. As usual, give this video a like if you found it useful. Give it a dislike if you didn't so not to do better for next time. Ask your questions in the comment section box below so I can help you and you can help others. If you really like this video, we have a Patreon page where you can support the channel and get exclusive perks like early access demo files and credits at the end of these videos. Thanks again for watching and see you in the next one. Bye bye.